Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. On today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at this CRT monitor and it's a VM1401C like Charlie. Never heard of this brand before, pro video. Flip down this little door and we have some controls. Tint, color, brightness, contrast, and volume. Yeah, there's a little speaker inside this set. Also on the front here is a little power switch. The set is not plugged in. So it's a physical power switch with a little LED there. In this video, we're gonna open this thing up, poke around inside and see if this thing works. It's got a metal side with a handle and flat metal top as well. And on the other side, we have the little speaker grill, another handle, really nice black chunky look to it. Still got a curvy screen though, so just a standard CRT affair. On the back, we have some ventilation. We have a little pop out here for the CRT neck. My assumption is that maybe this design was originally for black and white sets and the CRT isn't as deep. So they added this little pop out here so you could accommodate a color CRT. Down here in the corner, we have the video inputs, video in, video out, and a switch that's labeled high low, but almost certainly actually just turns on and off the 75 ohm termination. Because if you're gonna pass the video through the in and out here to another monitor, you would wanna have the termination disabled. You only wanna have it on the last set. We also have a couple RCA jacks for audio and a switch for S-Video. This thing actually has an S-Video input, IEC power input, and then we have product labels. So model number's blank, manufacturer date's blank. It says made in Taiwan. There is a serial number, but not like we can make heads or tails of that. Up here's that Pro Video logo again, and the model number, which we already talked about, 120 volts, one amp, 60 hertz, the standard warning text, and a German message here that does say 23 kilovolts. Now, normally you'd be thinking that something like this would be a pretty decent computer monitor, actually. Problem is, <laughs> this thing is well used, very well used. Now, I have no idea if the camera is gonna pick this up. I've tried to focus manually here, but it says camera one there, it's burned into the phosphor. We also have some writing up here, and then the overall condition of the CRT, I can see a lot of modeling in the phosphor where it's completely burned in just from hundreds or thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of use as is typical for a security monitor like this one. So with this burn in, clearly the CRT is completely shot. So I don't really intend to try to fix this thing if it doesn't work. The chunky cubicle good looks of this thing just scream for reuse and saving because this thing was destined for the trash. That's where it was found. So let's open this up and take a look at inside and see how worn out it looks on the inside. Looks like on the back cover here, we just take these screws off and then the back lid comes off. And then if you wanna take off the entire top, you can, there's some screws around the perimeter. Very typical security monitor construction. Now these security monitors are an interesting thing. I think long after they stopped selling CRTs in consumer electronics stores, like big box stores or whatever, TVs for your house, I think these security monitors kind of lived on, including monochrome ones and color ones. Most likely that's because there would be security stations within companies or whatever that had furniture just designed to hold these square cubicle monitors. And if they had one break, they wanted to replace it. They didn't wanna to have to like go through and change out all the furniture to accommodate flat screen TVs. These places are almost certainly using analog cameras that just won't look that good on widescreen 16 by nine monitors. So the idea would be just to keep using something like this to get some more years out of your security system. I haven't done this, but I bet you if we look for this model number that's on here, we'll probably find some old web pages where they were selling these things still and probably for a relative premium as well. I don't think they would be uh, super cheap, but uh, those companies almost certainly can't get these things anymore unless they have like some old stock floating around or something like that. Okay, all the screws are off. The cover sort of flopped down a little bit. And there it is. So on the back cover, we do have a few drip marks. Like this thing was exposed to a little bit of water. Maybe someone spilled something on here. It doesn't smell bad or anything. This was obviously used inside a, a company or whatever. I brought my studio light over here so we can hopefully get a good view in here. Now, one thing I'm noticing is that this thing is like super duper clean. Now, the fact is there are no vent holes on the top of this monitor. They're only on the sides and on the back. It means that dirt isn't really gonna fall into the monitor like it would in a regular television set that has all those vents along the top. Take a look at this. We have different CRT sizes that this board can almost certainly support. So this is the 14 inch version or 13 inch as it would typically be called here in the US. But it looks like we have a support for up to 21 inches and all the way down to 10 inches. I'm really quite amazed at how clean everything is. The flyback transformer here looks very good. Don't really see a lot of the soot or anything on there. 
We do have a little bit of soot on the wire here, but really considering there was so much burn in, it's minimal. And I know it's kind of dark, but you can make out the label on the CRT and it's that same brand as that Philips TV that I recently worked on where I replaced the guts with that CRT motherboard or the analog board I just got from AliExpress. So indeed, I really think this is one of the last companies that was making CRTs. And the one nice thing about this CRT manufacturer though is generally I found the CRTs they make to be very long lived, very bright and very durable. So I won't be surprised if this thing does work and produces actually a decent image, even with all that burn in. These CRTs are just pretty good and the emissive material they have in the back here just seems to be very long lived. Due to the lack of visibility in here, you won't be able to see, but I can see the main chip, the jungle I see, TDA 8361 made by Philips. I think that's a very similar chip to uh, what's in that Philips or Magnavox TV as well that I recently worked on. The main chip that's on here almost certainly is designed for CRTs like this that are kind of old school where they have analog controls because most of the time when you have a single chip that does everything like on this, like this set has, but like the, uh, the Magnavox set also had that we recently looked at, that chip usually is handling all the color and decoding all that stuff using digital controls while this thing simply has analog controls, which is kind of an interesting way to do it. But I guess to maintain that old school requirements that security cameras probably have, that's just the way they did it. Now, it seems like all of the ICs in this set are made by Philips. I can see three and they are all Philips. Now, date code wise, it looks like we're looking at around 2003, 33rd week, 34th week, thereabouts. So this set would have been made probably around that time or maybe a little bit after. Some more interesting things, taking a look at the neck board, it has two little spots for 14 inch or 10 inch, nothing is checked, but obviously we have the 14 inch version. So there must've been a different neck board in use on the 21 inch sets. We do have analog controls along the side here for the bias control and the drive controls. In typical fashion, you only have two drive controls, probably like a red and a blue or a green or a blue or whatever. And then you have three bias controls. Looking at the audio video board here, we have S video in the middle. We have audio down at the bottom and we have video at the top. This wire right here that I'm moving carries the S video signal. And this one up here is carrying the regular composite video. And this one's audio. We have a switch right here for S video or composite video. And that's certainly what these wires are for. So there obviously is some type of an IC on the main board here that switches the video signals. And this is the signaling that does that. Otherwise, looking at the board, I don't see any issues. Like there's no leaky caps or everything. Everything is held down with hot glue as opposed to that uh, type of glue that got corrosive and conductive over time. Looks like we have various brands of caps. I see Jamicon there. And I see a lot of caps that are the brand Fuhiu, F-U-H-I, YYU, completely unfamiliar with that one. So let's see if this worn out security camera monitor is actually working. I brought out a couple test pattern generators. There's a possibility that this thing actually supports PAL. And that might be useful if anyone is looking for a good PAL monitor here in North America. We'll test that because I have my PAL test pattern generator out right here. For now, I'm just gonna put these video connections inside the monitor there just to keep them safe because I'm gonna turn this around we're going to see what happens when we turn this on. Do I even hear high voltage? Yes. Yes, I do. The power lights on. Let's see if we have any kind of image of any kind. Uh, brightness is turned all the way up, but we're not seeing anything at all. All right, well, let's just turn those down for a second. And let's connect up the test pattern generator here. So I went and grabbed some BNC cables because that's how we're going to hook this thing up. With the video cable hooked up, I can hear this thing running. I can hear the 60 hertz refresh right now through the deflection yoke. You hear this kind of 60 hertz ticking, like, like a little buzzing almost. Look at that. Look at that. We actually have an image. Okay, you know what? Maybe I have that switch set to S video. So let's just double check. Uh, no, it's on video. Okay. Okay. I just turned off the studio light and I set the variable shutter speed. So we shouldn't see that bar anymore. I do see camera one really clearly there. Let's check these settings. Okay. There's color and there's tint. Yeah. <laughs> it looks freaking great. Okay. Contrast control all the way down and contrast all the way up. Okay. So it's not the brightest image. I mean, it's, it's completely watchable down here in the basic basement. This is the brightness control. So it's decoding these properly there. So we'll just turn that down to where it should be. Yeah, okay, so that's about as bright as it gets. So it's um, it's a little tired. This thing has never had its adjustments done. No calibration has ever been done once it left the factory, that is. 
and yet <laughs> it's so good. I, you know, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. Let's just look through some of these other things. So red looks good, green looks good. There's the uh, gray, you can really see. You might think this is dirt on the CRT, all this sort of stuff here, but that's not. That's burned into the phosphor itself. I cleaned the CRT really well on the outside. And um, yeah, can't quite make out what that stuff is, but obviously we've got shapes and stuff and there's that writing, which hopefully is visible in the camera. From a sharpness standpoint, mm, yeah, you know what? Having the contrast turned all the way up here actually creates quite a bit of blooming and it's not that sharp. If I turn it down to probably what used to be a bright image when it was new, this is really sharp. Like there is great definition in these lines, but when I turn the contrast all the way up, yes, it's producing a decently bright image, at least down here in the basement, but you lose all that definition and that sharpness, which definitely means that this CRT is just extremely tired. And actually looking at this test card here, you can really see how the CRT is being overdriven. Turning the contrast down to the middle setting on the pot, everything looks really good. But turning it up, look at this effect that's happening here. This part here is actually brightened up as well. And if I turn it down, it goes away. So there it's gone, but turn it up. The circuit is just overdriving the CRT. Now it's my assumption that when they built this thing, they probably designed it where you could just turn the contrast up as you needed to, as the CRT worn out, because CRTs are a wear item and they're just gonna get dimmer and dimmer over time. The phosphors are gonna wear out. The emissive material on the cathode is also gonna wear out. So the image is gonna get dimmer over time and you're gonna have to drive it harder and harder and harder to get a decent image. So they probably built this thing with a lot of headroom in the contrast controls. So you could keep turning it up as the CRT aged to keep getting usable life out of this set. I don't know why they retired this particular set. Maybe there's a fault in the board that will exhibit itself after it runs for a while, but for now it seems to be okay. But definitely the dim factor is, is certainly there. And if you're in a brightly lit room, like say at a front desk in an office building, this CRT is probably not really bright enough anymore to be useful in that environment. In a dark security closet, you know, in the back of the building, sure, probably still fine. But the people who are using this probably had to keep turning this contrast up further and further, which just overdrives the CRT. And yeah, that no longer looks good anymore. But at this setting, which is maybe 75%, it looks good, but we just have a much, much dimmer image. And while the camera auto game probably makes it look okay, yeah, it doesn't look super great in person. All right, so we know this thing works well. All right. Whoa. So was that the power cord that came out? Yes, it was the power cord that just came out. So that is not the fault of the set. Let's try that again. I was in the middle of speaking. We'll turn this back on. Takes a moment to start up. There it is. So as I was saying, this is a good NTSC monitor. If you find one of these that's not super worn out, then great. It's going to work really well for NTSC. I highly recommend it. In fact, the S video means that it'll work great as a Commodore monitor. Oh, you know what? Did it just arc? I thought I just heard a little bit of an arc out of it. As the flyback transformer ages, what can happen is the windings inside can start to break down and then you can start to have arcing. Now, on the other hand though, it can be soot and dust accumulating on the CRT around where the high voltage anode cap is. And sometimes discharging the CRT and then cleaning that whole area and also cleaning the high voltage lead comes off the flyback can sometimes correct that issue. So one thing you can do is while it's dark, like inside the set right here, and say you turn off the lights while it's running, if there is arcing, it might be visible externally and it might be coming from the flyback transformer down there, or it could be coming from up at the top of the CRT there. So just watch for it and see if you can see it. Now, personally, I've had plenty of monitors that had arcing problems and I've never been able to see where the arcing was coming from. I've had good luck cleaning the CRT around the high voltage anode cap and that actually worked. It, it got rid of the arcing. But other times I've done that and that had no actual effect and the arcing was coming from the flyback transformer itself. Usually internally to it, the windings are starting to break down because there's very thin windings in there that are carrying the very high voltage that goes to the CRT and there's just slight defects in the manufacturing or maybe moisture got inside or it's just broken down over time. And then what happens is it starts to arc between the windings. And usually when that gets really bad, the high voltage collapses. Like you actually lose all the high voltage and the CRT will blank out for a second and then the high voltage comes back and everything sounds normal. But you'll hear these loud snapping noises from inside the CRT. This one's not doing the loud snaps. It's just very quiet snaps. Now I'm not gonna spend a lot of effort doing that because the CRT in this thing obviously is toast, but the controller board in here almost certainly is working perfectly 
And even those caps, which are from the 2000s, right? 2003, seem to be working pretty well. So I guess uh, decently high quality. All right, time to switch over to the PAL test pattern generator to see how this thing does with a PAL signal. And indeed, it works perfectly with PAL, a vibrant, bright image. And of course, at this point, the tint control on the front doesn't do anything because PAL doesn't need a tint control. It's all automatic. Yeah, it looks freaking great. And this test pattern also looks perfect. And from a geometry standpoint, I mean, they have really no complaints with this set whatsoever. Geometry is quite good. I mean, we still have that blooming problem, of course, because of the CRT being so tired, but turning it down looks amazing. So I'd say the way this thing handles PAL is actually rather excellent because the way it compresses the image automatically, because of course PAL has more lines than NTSC. So if the set doesn't automatically compensate, a bunch of the lines are gonna go off the top and the bottom and you'll have to adjust the vertical size control. But this set doesn't have any external geometry control. So it's good that it handles it automatically. So if you find one of these, this is an excellent PAL and NTSC monitor, especially if you find one, of course, that's not worn out like this one. All right, now we know this is a multi-format monitor. I'm gonna hook up the Commodore 64 and let's just see how good it looks with this thing. The geometry might not be perfect for the 64 and it looks like the controls are all available in there, but they're not easy to reach. You'd have to remove the entire cover from this thing for that to work. All right, here's the Commodore 64 displaying NTSC graphics. I had to turn the brightness and contrast all the way up. Now, remember that this is a problem with this set and it's not like endemic for this particular monitor. Geometry is not great. I'd say it's a little shifted up towards the top right now. And that's not to say there aren't controls on the inside to adjust for that. But uh, with the Commodore 64, you can see the top border here isn't really visible at all. Not really a big problem because I think graphics are still gonna fit on the set, but it would be nice if we could shrink this down a little bit. The NTSC Commodore 64 image is always shifted up towards the top a little bit, like the border on the bottom is always a bit bigger. But from a centering perspective, yeah, it's not too bad. And if I turn the contrast down so it's not blooming and overdriving the CRT, it's really, really nice and sharp. It just looks wonderful. Now this is outputting video from the Quarry that's in my 64 here. So it's possible a real VIC-2 on a 64 that doesn't have a replacement RF modulator might not be as sharp, but this looks basically fantastic if it weren't for the dimness of this set. Now back in the Quarry config utility, we can switch this over to the PAL system and we hit save. And if I reset the computer or power cycle that is, we are gonna be in PAL. And I just adjusted the variable frame rate on the camera, so it should look good now. Yeah, this looks good as well. Same problem where it's overdriving the CRT, but turning this down, uh, you can see the geometry on the PAL mode actually looks great. We have plenty of border on the top and the bottom. With the easy flash back in, looks amazing. Let's do Adrian's dance party. I do have the audio hooked up. Let's hear that, how that speaker sounds. It's a speaker. It just sounds really, um, you know, Tinny, I guess is the right term. With no bass at all, but it's there. And, um, all right, it's distorting there, but whatever, it works. And the image looks great. Let's investigate the main chip on this set a little bit further. Looks like it came out in March, 1994. And luckily Philips has really good documentation for all of their chips, especially around this time. Let's take a look at the block diagram for this particular chip, the TDA8361. So there's a few things to notice here. There's this whole section here with the IF amplifier and demodulator. This thing fully supports a tuner. So this could be used in a regular television set. Obviously this entire section here is just unused in this set because there's no tuner. It also similarly has an entire audio demodulation section, which would be used as part of the tuner subsystem to allow it to decode the audio. I have a feeling none of this is probably used either, and I bet you the volume control and the audio input is just a separate little chip in this thing. This section right here handles the composite video and the S video, and you see there's a luminance switch and a chrominance switch. That's the external switch on this set that does enable the use of S video, and setting this thing to external S video does disable the internal trap filtering on the composite video or the luminance signal, which will soften the image. So enabling S video does indeed give you much sharper picture quality, and it could also be used to input put a monochrome video signal into this set, allowing you to see nice sharp text, even if there's no color. And then the big question I know everyone wants to ask is, can you RGB mod this set? 
And absolutely you can. There's an RGB input right there, along with the fast blanking input, RGB in is what it's labeled on pin 21. This was certainly added to allow for on-screen displays to overlay those graphics on top of the composite or the S-Video input as it comes through the luminance matrix right here before it gets converted to the output stages that goes to the neck board itself. And even better here, taking a look at the RGB inputs on those pins, see it says RGB input for on-screen displays. The voltage it expects is zero to 0 0.7 volts, which is exactly the same as what RGB signals are coming out of like a Commodore Amiga, an Atari ST, or other RGB sources. So this set should be very easy to RGB mod. You just need some 75 ohm resistors to ground and some capacitors. And ideally you'd probably want to add some diodes there, some protection diodes. Uh, you'd have to adjust your termination resistors just to make sure you maintain the 0 0.7 volts peak to peak. As is usual for sets like this where we're using the RGB inputs that's used for on-screen displays normally, there's no specific sync input for that. So you typically input your sync signal into the composite video input, and which gets brought up here to the whole part of the circuit inside this IC that handles the syncing. To enable the RGB input to be overlaid on top of the composite video, you just have to bring this RGB input above ground. I think uh, one volt is probably good enough, but all the way up to five volts is probably fine. And in fact, if you're inputting a regular composite signal into this set, which you can do, and it will use that for sync, then toggling this switch is kind of cool because it will just allow you to compare the quality of the RGB video versus the composite video. Here's something interesting. So to switch between various inputs and stuff like that, there is a pin 16, which takes different voltage levels on the inputs. So anything less than 0.5 volts is gonna use the internal composite video. And you might be wondering, what does that mean exactly? Well, if you're using the external tuner on this thing, then that decoding of the intermediate frequencies down to composite video will be visible when this is less than five volts. Obviously on this thing, we'd never wanna do that because there's no tuner hooked up but it looks like if you have the DC in the range of three to five volts, then you're gonna be in S video mode where the composite video is only gonna be used as the luminance signal and the chrominance or the external chrominance signal input is turned on and the trap is turned off. That, that removes the chrominance filter that is normally applied onto the luminance signal, which removes like dot crawl and stuff like that which will have the effect of really improving sharpness if you're using a monochrome input, like say something like an Apple II in text mode. If you have the DC over 7.5 volts, and keep in mind this chip runs on eight volts, then you're just in normal composite video mode where the color decoding is actually happening through the composite video input, the chrominance input is turned off, and the filter trap is turned on. Indeed, the audio also is selected external. And the reason for that is because the internal routing is for the tuner again, where the tuner has the audio actually in the received signal and the chip is decoding that audio internally. So again, not used on this set. What I do find interesting about this particular chip though, is I don't see any pins on this thing used for handling geometry. So all of the geometry controls for like horizontal size, vertical size need to be handled in an analog fashion outside of this chip. It does have inputs for things like brightness control, along with contrast, saturation, and hue. So those go into this chip and that affects the color decoding and the conversion of the composite video to RGB that goes to the neck board. But really the biggest takeaway from this is this set is easily RGB modded. And that's actually a really cool extra feature. All right, that's gonna be it for the video. I just wanna do a quick one on this Pro Video VM1401C. These security camera monitors are kind of like a little piece of gold. Finding a monitor that can do PAL and NTSC here in North America is extremely rare. There just aren't a lot of monitors that can do that. I know for our friends in Europe and the rest of the world, that's just completely run of the mill, but here it's not. So if you find one of these monitors out thrifting, garage sales or wherever, estate sales or auctions, I would definitely grab it because this thing is just a unique combination that makes a really good retro computer monitor. And of course, the other thing about it is the chunky square good looks of this thing are excellent because you can stack stuff on top of it like I have this 64 on here, which is that much better. So I highly recommend this monitor and it seems like it's easy to work on. The parts are high quality in there. And if you do need to swap the CRT, you should have no problem. Find an old junk 13 inch TV like that Magnavox one I showed on the main channel and stick the CRT in this thing. It's actually quite capable. If you enjoyed this video, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen over there. They get early access to videos, behind the scenes content, things like that. If you wanna become a patron, there's a link in the description below. This is the second channel, so a subscribe would be very much appreciated. Thumbs up, of course, all the usual YouTube junk. And I guess that is gonna be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, 
and I'll see you next time. Bye.